Welcome everyone to the Systems Challenges of Cybersecurity presented by Jeff Seeley. My name is Donna Long and I will be your host during today's webinar. Jeff Seeley has been a systems engineer for 29 years. He has worked extensively in the Aegis Combat System and the Aegis Weapon Systems in the transition from the mill standard environment to commercial off-the-shelf designs as a member of the Navy Review Team. Jeff has supported the Missile Defense Agency's Ballistic Missile Defense System and the Surface Ship Undersea Warfare Combat System to develop the Torpedo Weapon System. One of his latest projects has been to develop the Cybersecurity Strategy document as part of the Advanced <clears throat> Capability Build 20 for the Aegis Combat System. Throughout his career, he has used the model-based systems engineering approach with Vitex Core product. Before Jeff gets started, I have a few housekeeping items. We will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. Please send your questions as soon as you think of them through the question tab on the webinar control panel. Jeff will answer as many questions as he can today, but if we do not get to your question, we will reach out to you after the webinar. The, the webinar is being recorded. If you experience connection problems during the live presentation, a recording will be available within one business day. The recording will be published to Vitex Webinar Archive, located on our website. At the conclusion of this webinar, a survey will open up on your screen. Please take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you would like to see covered in future webinars. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Jeff. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone. First, let me say that I spent almost two years in the cyber environment as a system engineer and was often asked to look at how better to implement cybersecurity, specifically for Navy combat systems. While I am not a cybersecurity guru with the emergence of the importance of cyber in every work environment, I learned the framework to be able to best help my clients. I am a system engineer who is looking for the most efficient ways to solve problems. For those of you sitting in today who are closely familiar with cyber, you may have encountered the same issues I did with the feeling of the perpetual circle or the good old chicken and egg theory. It's difficult to break into an existing project and figure out how and what is really being done. On the other hand, if you are instituting a greenfield project new to a company, which means a clean sheet of paper from start to finish, this may save you some, fr some frustration in the long run or on a redo or several redos as I have seen in the past. Today I will use high-level descriptions and examples of the cybersecurity process used by some in the Department of Defense with good results, as it teaches a method which, which builds the cyber requirements from the get-go. By using Viatech Core, one can augment and interact with these methods like completing a puzzle. For those of you that have only heard about cyber this and cyber that, hopefully after the webinar today, you will have a better understanding. The DOD instructions and publications I will refer to today are available for use with private companies as well. One of the first processes I was introduced to was the Information Technology Risk Approval, better known as the pit prey process. This was interesting as this document was written for something called authorization to operate systems and was and is part of the Department of Defense information assurance accreditation and accreditation process known as DICAP. This authorization document is of paramount importance to the DOD project as it is what drives funding. This is an ongoing evaluation in a fixed period of time and manage the, manages the life cycle cybersecurity risk to DOD information technology. But let's make note right now that this is being superseded by a new process called Risk Management Framework. In 2015, the Department of Defense began establishing and transitioning to the Risk Management Framework, or RMF, for IT and the associated cybersecurity policies. They also began assigning responsibilities for the ex execution to an important guidance document known as the National Security System Instruction. This is a companion guide to the Risk Management Framework, which we already established was a new tool in assuring success in cybersecurity, and also a tool familiar to most in DOD 
is the National Institute of Standards and Technology Special Publication, or NIST. While there are over a dozen NIST publications, Special Publication 853, which is specifically used to apply risk management framework, will be referred to going forward. This is a guidance tool for federal information systems and in many cases may be used commercially for systems as well. Traditionally speaking, the common practice for a long time has been to consider cybersecurity an afterthought. So you have companies purchasing equipment in the acquisition process, which of course presets the stage in the development path leading to the design phase before looking at how they need to include cyber. Now the only option is to bolt or paint on cyber at the tail end, which can be done, but it's not efficient and engenders multiple problems, which is why I was constantly asked to bridge the gap. Picture two rooms, one full of system engineers and one full of cyber people. My solution to bridge the gap was found in using Viatech's tool called Core. Let's first look at the definition of cyber. This is an American heritage definition of cyber. I've used a student definition. In speaking with other groups, their definition leans towards one big question. Is someone else's code co-opting my hardware? And yes, there are plenty of other definitions, but for the purposes of this discussion, these are the two most pertinent. Since this discussion focuses on cybersecurity, let's define this as well. This is a basic definition again from the Merriam Dictionary. This next description is more of an industry definition. I would like to highlight security concepts and guidelines first as these will be discussed in more detail later. Also notice that cybersecurity environment organizations, we will also talk about these as later as well. I will also provide a little insight into what NIST's role is in this cybersecurity environment. So let's now talk about NIST Special Publication 853. It provides a catalog of security and privacy controls for federal information systems and organizations and a process for selecting controls to protect organizational operations and assets, individuals, other commercial organizations, and the nation. These include protection from a diverse set of threats, including hostile cyber attacks, natural disasters, structural failures, and human errors. Security and control assessment and privacy control assessment are not about checklists, simple pass and fail results, or generating paperwork to pass inspections or audits. Rather, such assessments are the principal vehicle used to verify that implemented security controls and privacy controls are meeting their stated goals and objectives. There are a number of directives and standards that drive cybersecurity. Keep in mind that each organization has their own path to follow for cyber, but these directives are good to build the framework for success. So how do we incorporate all these new technologies we are designing? In last month's webinar from Viatech, David Long's topic was re-imaging system engineering. He introduced a concept called transform our practice. With that, he showed and described the eight plus dimensions to our challenge. Recognizing that system engineering has many dimensions, visualizing them sometimes is difficult. And as David pointed out last month, this is probably not all the dimensions, but it does start to make us think about the entire system engineering magnitude. I have added to the implement, implementation technology, cybersecurity, a technology in system engineering. System, cybersecurity will need new additional skill sets. 
Each of these dimensions will be affected differently with these two new additions. So let's look at the most affected dimensions. First look at the system level. We see that cybersecurity has impacts at all the system levels, starting in reverse order from the from the cyber starting in the reverse level and impacts at system level starting in reverse order from the environment to the component level, which we will focus on more in this presentation. Cybersecurity will also have impact on the life cycle phase, model type purpose, and complexity. Cybersecurity's effect or effectiveness on lifespan is also difficult to quantify. As we all know, the cyber environment changes daily. This dimension will be difficult to monitor, so keep this in mind as time moves on. Precedence is an interesting dimension for those who encounter implementing cybersecurity for the first time. Do you have the right team to implement this dimension? While it may be unprecedented for some, this may just be a product line improvement for others. Cybersecurity will most likely drive all of these dimensions and many times will require a new team approach. I plan to show you the architecture of the controls and how they influence cybersecurity with a goal of integrating these into your future projects. This is a description of the risk management framework instruction. These are just highlights of the RMF process and the instruction. We are going to talk about these bullets in a little more detail. So let's do a brief overview of what we have covered. The diagram here shows the flow of three documents we are working with today. The National Security Systems Instruction directs the use of the risk management framework material. And, other, and the other National Institutes of Standards and Technology, the NIST Instruction, Cybersecurity Controls, and Enhancements. In turn, the Risk Management Framework is an instruction that is supported by two other documents in this, doc, in this particular diagram with other NIST instructions that can be used at a later date. But for today, we are only going to work and refer to NIST 853. This shows all six steps of the risk management process with bulleted descriptions for each step. Today we will talk about steps one and two and how they will enable cybersecurity requirements early in the engineering process. Step one guides the system team in selecting the categorization system and the cyber controls which will be applicable. For today, I want to focus on the fourth bullet, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which are the provisional impact values, as well as their subsets, which highlight high, moderate, and low impact systems. This documents how this influences the early stages of system engineering. The selection of the system criticality is one of the most important aspects of determining the applicable controls. Notice that the information's importance is evaluated here and sets the criteria for the controls required for cybersecurity. The selection criteria is based on this matrix. Notice that a low impact has limited adverse effect, moderate has a serious effect, and high has a severe or catastrophic effect on the system being evaluated. Here are some questions you might define in this process. For confidentiality, how can mal a malicious adversary use the unauthorized disclosure of information to do limited, serious, or severe harm to agency operations, agency assets, or individuals? For integrity, would unauthorized modification or destruction of elements of the information type violate laws, executive orders, or agency regulations? For availability, how would the temporary loss of information and information systems or the permanent loss of information or information systems affect the agency's operations, agency assets, or individuals?
since step one is selecting a control, let's take a look at NIST control as it and NIST control as it appears. This is AC1. Most are much longer than this one, so I selected this particular control today because it fits on one page and will be easier to manage for our purposes. So let's walk through what data is presented for a control. Security controls are also designated by families. You will find the family names at the top of each control. I have listed the 18 family names as well. This is the actual security control. It defines what needs to be done to enable the implementation of this control. Supplemental guidance sections are general descriptions of the security control and do not contain any requirements. It does describe the control in more detail. In reviewing the control, the team should also determine the type of requirement the control will produce, technical, procedural, or physical. As stated previously, the priority and baseline allocation describes the confidentiality, integrity, and availability for specialized sets of controls or overlays tailored for specific types of missions or business functions, technologies or environments of operation. A note about priority and baseline allocation impact. During the evaluation, the highest impact is used to select a control. So if any one of the three ends up moderate, then the control is moderate, even if the other two controls' impact is low. This is a description of step two of the risk management framework. This is the starting point to identify and designate baseline security controls based on the approved categorization from step one. This is where the control required for the design is selected. Under RMF, this should be completed early enough in the design to develop requirements. This is an example of an original control statement. This statement is highlighted to show how it would be decomposed into discrete testable requirements. The word highlighted in red and in or is what we call dirty words or words that are very difficult to check off during testing. These make for compound requirements and make testing for repeatable and testable requirements difficult. In addition to common delineated lists and statements that say this and that. These dirty words have been used to capture high level thoughts, but again make it tough during testing. The derived requirements are individual shall statement requirements which can be tested and checked off individually. These would be integrated into the system requirements. We will look closer at how this is done. In this particular statement regarding requirements, on numbers two and four, take note that they contain the process for financial analysis in relation to the available funds, which is an important aspect of any company's consideration and planning for the implementation of cyber, but one we won't be covering today. With the introduction of the new process called Risk Management Framework, or RMF, and the application of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, controls for DOD and IT and other commercial systems, cyber can be applied more effectively and efficiently to identify IT security requirements early in the acquisition process to influence the design phase. The system engineering process needs to shift with the emphasis on tracking these RMF controls and needs to integrate these security requirements with the system requirements. The engineering process will go on to track the multiple relationships in the design phase, which will influence the integration accomplished using CORE. So let's take a look at Vitek's model-based system engineering tool CORE, which enables system engineering system engineers to maintain relational interdependencies through layered decomposition, aids in the design through linked requirements, provides decision makers with the constant decision support information, captures risk for focused assessment and mitigation analysis. All data is captured in a single repository, 
which allows for data to be viewed in multiple ways, assesses the strength and weaknesses of proposed system of systems, all this is done with a comprehensive extensible schema definitions. Core also has a powerful import export analysis and graphical visualization technologies. So with this overview, let's take a much closer look at the components of Core which can mitigate many of the issues we've we have previously discussed. So take a look with me directly at the core tool. Starting down the left side, you'll see the facilities and class window pane. Selected for this view is the requirement subfolder NIST 853 1 to 300. On the right side top, there is a box around the elements, which is the actual content of NIST 853 1 to 300. And selected is 130 NIST 853, which is highlighted. Last in the lower right is the relationship attribute, which shows, in this case, the refined requirements for 130 NIST 853. Looking at the top right side of the window, I want to show you the display data for the selected top level control. I think it's important to show that the data relevant to this control and the details that are associated with it. The very top is the control name then the control description. The third one down is originating document title. Next is type. Here is where we determine the type of requirement, technical, procedural, or physical, and it would be tracked here. Key performance parameter identifies true or false whether or not this is a key performance parameter. Origin differentiates between originating requirements, derived requirements, or design decisions. Rationale. This is used to document the reasoning for the description or rejection associated with a decision point, concern, or a change request. Next is paragraph number. Paragraph number is the number of the source paragraph from which this originating requirement was extracted. The paragraph title is the title of the source paragraph from which the originating requirement was extracted. And last is relations. This area contains the list of relationships. We will look more closely at this next. The relations for 130 NIST 853 contain refined by requirements, which are com com decomposed requirements for the control and can be allocated to the physical or logical architecture in the model. These requirements are retained in one place in core and can be allocated as needed. From this relationship view, a specific requirement can be selected to determine where this requirement is allocated to. So let's look at refined requirement 130.2.2 .2 .2, NIST 853. This is what is known as the property, the property sheet in core. In this case, for the selection of 130.2.2 NIST 853 has the property shown that were discussed earlier, as the same names that were discussed earlier, description, title, type, key performance, originate, origin, type, and attributes. This shows the actual relationship the requirement has to specifies components. This permits the engineer to determine the impact of any given requirement or related specified relationship during any phase of the life cycle. Notice that this requirement specifies a number of components. Let me show you a view from the component aspect. From the facilities view, I have class component highlighted. In elements, I have 1.11.4 selected. And in the lower right in the, in the relations window, boxed in red are the specified requirements for that component. This is a portion of the physical architecture from the core repository used in this presentation. 
The processors in red boxes are just two of the many seen. I would like to show you a number of other views that can also be displayed from the core repository. This one shows a unique view of the built from for the physical decomposition with the associated specified by for requirements for this particular processor. <laughs> I know this is an eye chart. However, from the same repository and core, I did this view just to show the complexity of the requirements to processors. We are often asked if CORE can produce system modeling language or SysML diagrams. This is also provided directly from the repository. As we come to the end of our presentation, let's take a look at a spreadsheet directly from CORE tracing the requirements directly to components. In this case, it could be done for any number of aspects in the repository. Cyber needs to be managed during the system engineering process. Developing the requirements from the controls would enable projects to early on determine what cybersecurity requirements need to be integrated into the design. Just as the stealth bomber was developed with a low radar cross-section, Cybersecurity in today's system should be integrated. In conclusion, we have looked at a much more efficient way to incorporate and manage cybersecurity in the design of a system from beginning to end rather than the dated method commonly used by DOD and other companies, which initiates all kinds of redesign issues. The use of core is a paramount key in avoiding this bolt-on, paint-on method saves time, money, and results in a better system. I hope I have given you some insight into the cybersecurity issues, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff. We do have a few questions, thanks to our, all our participants. I encourage you to join the discussion now and submit your questions using your webinar control panel. If you do need to leave the webinar now, please take a moment before you go to respond to the quick survey that will pop up on your screen. Our first question comes from Jason. Is there any advantage to creating cybersecurity functions and associating the cybersecurity requirements? There are organizations now that are actually using um, the requirements and creating functions so that they can actually allocate functions to hardware components. As you saw, there were a lot of processors in that particular diagram you could create that function and associate it with each one of those which would make tracking and changes much easier so there are folks starting to work in that direction. Okay, um, question from Amy. How many controls are there in NIST 800-53? There are about 570 controls and if you looked at all the highs you'd end up with about 540, 530 and it's quite a list when you start to look down those and decide how many of those you can actually implement in a design. So some of those are being incrementally decomposed and used in designs. That was a good question. Okay, we've got a follow-on from there. Are the NIST 853 requirements in core as delivered to customers for use of the tool? I guess Taylor is asking, um, would he get a um, copy of the 853 requirements in core? We, we don't specifically, Vitech doesn't have them. There are organizations in DOD that are actually doing that work. I decompose some of these for today. They exist and I think you're going to see as, as risk management framework work moves forward, you're going to see organizations that actually post those so that organizations don't have to recreate the wheel and and do all the work of decomposition. So currently it's not delivered with core, but I think you will see those available in the very near future. Okay. The next question is from Ronald. In implementing security controls, often a multi-level approach is desired. How does core address a security control requirement that includes technical, procedural, and physical aspects? 
You know, some of the controls actually are multidimensional. They do. I haven't seen any that can contain physical and procedural, but I have seen procedural and technical. In the decomposition of that control, you would actually tag those as um, derived requirements with those different aspects. That's why I pointed out that you can actually keep track of how that derived requirement is applicable. And it's done best early. So while you're looking at, that's why I pointed out the, um, the description, if you actually look at the description and decide what that control applicability is, then you can actually track it as the decomposed requirement, which will help you tremendously later. Okay. Um, we've got another message from S. Khan. It's, how does MBSE approach support NIST CSF implementation? CSF. I need to know what he means or she means by CFS. Cybersecurity Framework. Oh, Cybersecurity Framework. Um, you know, you've got to start, read that to me one more time, Donna. How does MBSE approach support NIST SCF implementation? Here's the, the requirements early on, and, and I talked about all the requirements coming from one repository and being kept in one place. <coughs> being able to track those requirements and, and know where they're actually allocated to gives you a tremendous advantage when somebody starts to ask where this requirement's applicable and are we actually implementing it. And you can do that, again, you can look at them through a, a, a filter of, of, of either technical, physical, or procedural, and you can actually look at how many of each have been implemented. That's why actually categorizing them early would help. And in the framework, it would then be able to allow you to report to somebody what requirements and where they're where they're applied, and you can actually create um, documentation to support that for for um, anybody looking for how that's been done. I guess the best word is OQE, objective quality um, material. Okay. Um, the same person had an earlier question, and so they may have. Um, you may have answered this already, but let me ask this specifically. Are there tailoring guidelines for specific industries that tie in with systems engineering methodology? There are, in, in the NIST special publications, there are a dozen publications, and there are many of those that are actually tailored to very specific applications. So what you need to do is look through the NIST documentation library. It's online. You can, you can go to the NIST page and you can look at all the special publications and look for tailored. Now, many of those are derived after you look at 853. So they may, you may have to start at 853 and then look at some of the subcontrols from that and then look at the tailored documents that are in addition to those. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. That wraps up our final QA for today's presentation. If you have any other questions or comments for Jeff, please don't set, hesitate to send him an email. You see his email on the screen. Or you can post your questions and comments on our LinkedIn group page. Just visit LinkedIn.com and search for Vitech Corporation. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Our next webinar will be How to Engineer a System of Systems Using Core by Fran McCafferty on March 21st. The registration link is available on our webinars page. Remember that at the conclusion of this webinar, a survey will open on your screen. Please take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. Once again, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day.